We acknowledge the Yuggera and Ghana nations as traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and learn, and their continuing connection with the land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their elders past and present. All content related to this program is for general informational purposes only and contains stories and discussion around mental health that may be disturbing to some listeners. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional and individual advice and support. More details are contained in our show notes. Welcome to the annual Existential Angst Awards, otherwise known as the Angsties. Your host tonight, last year's all-round winner sweeping all categories... Depression. Thanks for having me. I didn't deserve to be here. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm just going to get on with it so you don't have to look at me all night. Firstly, a couple of honourable mentions to a couple of nominees who couldn't be with us tonight. Panic. Had to leave the building early, but put up a good fight beforehand. And Avoidance. Had other things to do, so couldn't be with us. In Memoriam. Sponsored by All Bottled Up, the concealer professionals use. It's been a big year and we've lost a lot of good emotions along the way. Please take a moment as we remember joy, happiness, enthusiasm, flow, contentment, motivation, hope and optimism. Nominees for this year's Angsty, brought to you by Panacea, the magic pill we've all been looking for. Runners up for this year's Angsties are... Imposter syndrome for feeling like you're never good enough, no matter who praises you. Failure. I've seen plenty of that. Grief. For turning our world upside down and making you question everything about life. And the winner of this year's angsty is... Toxic Positivity. Competing for its 50th year in the angsties with a first time win. Toxic positivity started off as a thought you could choose to feel better, then rose to fame by covering up all emotions it deemed as too negative just for the hell of it. In its 50th year for Andy and 40th for Louise, Toxic Positivity will now accept their award. Ah! Oh my god, this is so amazing. Good vibes only. Look where it got me. Hashtag blessed. I just want to show gratitude to myself for just building that bridge and getting over it. We all have mountains to climb. Just make sure you enjoy the view along the way. I always think on the bright side and I tell myself that I am doing so much better than many, many others. We love you, toxic positivity. Yeah, never give up. And remember, there is always somebody worse off than you. Everything happens for a reason. Any of this sounding familiar? Because it was familiar to us, and we really wanted to find a way to reframe our mind to just be happy. I'm Louise Poole. And I'm Andy Leroy, and this is Reframe of Mind. The series that cuts through the platitudes and gets to the core of living authentically, challenging our assumptions and improving mental health, with the guidance of good science, philosophy, and learning from other people's lived experiences. When we started making this series, we wanted to make something to help us find that ongoing connection to happiness that we're told is just waiting for us right around the corner. But along the way, we discovered that happiness, if you're not careful, can turn into just another carrot on a stick that you keep on chasing. Lisa Thomas here. Now, I'm suddenly confronted, you know, I've been up until that point, this, you know, selfish, goal-orientated athlete. Mum was always supporting me and, you know, looking out for me. And and then this situation happened. And I was just like, no, that's not happening. And so that, that point, I had to stop training and running, obviously. Put all of my energies and focus into her rehabilitation. Nathan Parker. I already felt at that point that I'd lost that childhood dream twice. At the end of the day, when the chips are down, I couldn't walk away from flying without working out what was possible. So this is probably not the self-help podcast that you were expecting. We're never going to tell you that all you need to do is meditate your feelings away because... That's not what any of our guests told us either. Tisha Rose. You know, like there's such a sense of helplessness when you're stuck in a body that you can't move or when you're in hospital alone at night, just scared of what Mm. your future will be and just at an absolute loss as to how you can possibly move forward and whether you'll ever get better. Derek McManus. I started speaking out loud to myself and saying, Derek, don't give up. 
Derek, keep on fighting. As my vision was closing down, there were two rifle shots from outside the house. And when I heard those two rifle shots, it was absolute confirmation for me that my mates from Star Group were on their way to get me and things were going to be all right. There is still something possible, you know, something good that's going to possibly come out of this uh, that went through my mind at that time. How you feel is valid and you feel that way for a reason. Daniel Flynn. My biggest personal struggle as an individual or a leader w- was battling uh well, actually, what a wonderful psychologist who sat across the room from me helped me unpack, which was a fear of rejection. So I was so afraid of people rejecting me. And I, I kind of I packaged it up as like a fear of failure. I didn't want to fail. Lisa Alexander. Yeah, look, it is what it is. I'm not yeah. going to, you know, cry about it. It's something that I need to recognise and understand and try not to get, you know, too, too dark about as well um, or bitter. Uh, But yeah, you're right. You can hear it in my voice. It's still emotional. Until we look deeper into why we think and act the way we do, we won't know who we truly are. And good vibes only will only go so far into how we feel. The vault system. What I am really here to do is to speak to 16-year-old me and to show them that they are loved and they are worthy and they have a future and they deserve to exist and they don't have to justify themselves to everyone and... I get that in my work a lot. I work with a lot of young people and I have a lot of teenagers who, you know, will message me on Instagram and say, seeing you on my feed every day helps me feel like I can get to adulthood. Andrew Griffiths. And so do you think that that her leaving you with this old lady was an act of neglect or was it an act of love? What this podcast does is go beyond the platitudes, blending medical science with psychology philosophy and lived experiences together with our own personal stories. Lisa Salzman. Our mind was built to find the bad stuff. That's our mind's design is to look for threat, to look for the negative, to look at what might go wrong to protect ourselves. Marin Irish. This is a huge topic in terms of cognitive neuroscience of memory, is whether memory and imagination are actually the same thing. There was a discovery just over 10 years ago now that when people are remembering events from their past and when they're envisaging events that might happen in the future, the same core brain regions and same core network activates. Our hope is that you will find some tools that are meaningful for you and will help you to empower yourself to live authentically. Because the only person who can empower you is you. Sally Goldner. I didn't feel I valued myself for the first 29 and a half years of my life up until 27 April 1995, which was the first time I ever heard the word transgender. And at that point I realised was I thought, I've gone a long way down by fighting this thing. I wonder what would happen if I went with it. Lucy Blue. I almost fantasise about the best case scenario because I have just as much control over that. So I actually just find that a good way to stop myself getting anxious. There are a lot of great tools already available and one thing we've found is that sometimes they just don't seem to work. Or if they do, they work for a short period without any real long-lasting effect. Kimberly Norris. You know, suddenly I I feel really selfish and I feel really petty because it's now not enough. And it's because, think about how you got there. You worked for it. You practiced things. You took positive risks. So it's not actually the outcome that brought the reward. It was the process. And we can create that process ourselves throughout our lives. Marie Thiessen. We often have this sense that it's just that you don't have enough willpower, that if you had enough willpower, if you were strong enough, you pulled your socks up, then you solved the problems. And it just isn't that simple. It's not that it's impossible, but it isn't a simple case of just pull your socks up. We wanted to present a range of professional opinions and lived experiences to learn from others and help you do the same. But we came to a realisation along the way. The best way to learn, verify and demonstrate the effectiveness of these concepts was going to mean that we had to try these things on ourselves. Because it would seem a little bit odd to make a series about living authentically if we weren't prepared to apply what we were discussing to our own stories and experiences. Dinesh Palapana. I made a promise to myself that I would come back a better person than uh, I ever was. Hugh Kearns. Then the imposter syndrome sort of keeps cropping up all the time and most people feel like this. You know, when you look at the surveys and the research, at least 70% of people. Jane Madden. Mental health is everyone's business and I think it doesn't matter whether you're a student or in corporate, perhaps in a leadership role. I think the COVID crisis has just brought a new awareness and encouraged even more conversations about 
mental health in Australia. Sometimes it feels like life is happening to us, like we're living in autopilot. Then all of a sudden we're faced with loss or conflict or some other uncomfortable situation that we'd rather not be in. Marta Vinawana Parker. Sometimes people don't deserve our forgiveness, but we deserve to forgive them so we can let go of it. Brando Yelovich. You know, there I was paddling down a river and the dam got opened at the top and I got totally destroyed and thrown out of my raft and pushed to the very bottom. I reached a point down under the water where I just stopped trying to get back to the surface. I came to terms with the fact this was the end. How often have you felt like you're not good enough? Looking for and finding all the evidence you need to support that in the comments, behaviours and attitudes of people around you. Suzanne Mercia. It's a persistent belief that we're not good enough. Then we also might have a critical inner voice that comes along with that. Probably the biggest thing is that we will tend to give more credence to somebody externally than we will to our own judgment. Dr Happy, Tim Sharp. It's okay not to be okay. Sadness and grief and anxiety and frustration and even, even anger and these are normal human emotions. We all experience them, and there are usually good reasons for experiencing them. Ever bottled something up for so long that it just blurts out one day? Oh, maybe in a fit of rage against someone you love and would never dream of hurting. But there you are, and you can't take any of what you said back. Annie Harvey. I think it's really critical that people know how close they are to what we call falling off the cliff, because once you fall off, once you're burnt out, it takes a really long time to heal. It's not like bouncing back, as we like to call it, after a couple of weeks. It can take six months or even up to two years to actually heal from that. Alex Moritz. We're in such a fluid and such a lifestyle and disrupted world that you've actually got no choice but you have to change. Before, people didn't have multiple careers. Now you don't often meet a mature age person that hasn't had three or four different careers, different kinds of jobs, in and out of jobs. You don't get jobs for life, not even in the big corporate companies. Have you ever faced that question, who am I? And not been able to give yourself an answer much past your job title. Or your family position, or maybe some other surface explanation of what you like, glossing over the question altogether. Who Who are are you? you? Joe Fogus. We are biased and influenced by society. We are profoundly social creatures, and almost everything we think and know comes from somebody else. Chris Helder. The bottom line is people are sick and tired of being told to be positive because bad things do happen, bad things have happened, bad things have happened to all of us. And when people come up to you and just say, hey, come on, be positive about it, you really want to just punch them in the mouth. What's important to you without thinking about it in the context of the groups you belong to? What do you value? Stuck? You're not alone. We're often labelled as self-indulgent for even trying to express what's important to us, right? Jacinta Carbu. You don't ask, you don't get. You have to put yourself out there and you have to do it. Like, they don't, someone doesn't know that you want this if you don't let them know. Keenan Muir. We need these platforms. I want to produce this platform so young people, generations in front of me can not only have this platform, but also thrive from this platform. I do this to benefit, you know, seven generations in front of me. Nobody cares, right? Except we should. Because it's valid and we deserve to be heard. Nellie Thomas. I had a couple of miscarriages when we were trying to have children and it wasn't until I started telling people that I'd had a miscarriage that I realized how common it was. You know, Mm. so many women I knew had had miscarriages that I didn't know about. And I think mental health is the same. Openness begets openness. After we spoke to all of these people, we realized that we have far more in common with each other than we do differences. And it's the intersection of our stories that can help us to see our common ground. Bill Thompson. There's a really interesting connection between music and beliefs. Music is a lot like language in the sense that it unfolds over time. It implies meaning without actually presenting that meaning in an explicit way. And so anything that's accompanying that music, I think we take seriously. Sally Goldner. Let's bust the binaries to use a favourite say. We do have similarities. We need food, we prefer shelter, we need to sleep, those sorts of things at a very basic level. But then it's about how we value difference rather than see it in a negative light. And it takes some effort to do that, to really keep ourselves as balanced as we can in the face of that. As we grow and evolve, we shape our minds. But those minds are far from fixed objects, if we choose for that to be the case. So, where do we start? 
Daphne Kapitas. I'm not going to allow anybody to make me hate them. And my mum would say that to me too. There's ancient Greek sayings that say whether somebody hates you or they love you, what you don't want is for them to feel sorry for you. Suzanne Mercier. I just have a way of looking at things, I think, that puts it into a different perspective. I can immediately reframe something and see the positive. Andrew Griffiths. I've got to reframe situations rather than keep telling that old broken story about my mother abandoned me, this happened, you know, she's the cause of all my problems, rah, rah. Lucy Bloom. I get to reframe my whole life. I see that as an opportunity. I have some time to grieve it, but then you can only move forward. Leanne Carey. Reframe the mind. It's about adapting and learning. Neuroplasticity of the brain is the mechanism or the phenomenon that supports that adaptation and learning. And if we engage in the tasks and we believe in this and we've got a little bit of that know-how how how to do it, then we can achieve that change with both the discovery and the knowledge. We initially planned for 10 episodes, but Reframe of Mind has turned into a 42-part series, thanks to the generosity of our guests in sharing their stories and insights. All of the guests are Australian or New Zealand experts from diverse walks of life across various spectrums. This series reaches across gender, ethnicity, sexuality, as well as physical and mental diversity. We set out with the intention to include as many diverse voices as we possibly can. Some voices you wouldn't normally get to hear speaking at length, if at all. All of our guests had so much more to offer than our preconceived notions of them. Even though this is the first episode you're hearing, it's the last one we wrote. So, spoiler alert, we know exactly how this journey ends up for us. And as uncomfortable, risky and uncertain it has been along the way, it's the best thing we've ever done. So, who are we? Well, if you recognise my voice, it's because I was on Brisbane Radio for eight years. Or you might have heard me in Darwin or Newcastle Mm -hmm. or one of the other cities or towns I broadcast from. Andy, I worked in media since I was 14 years old. Whoa. (laughs) That's a long time. (laughs) Being a radio announcer is all I ever wanted to do. Um, Friday nights, local community station, I was at school, my first interview, Savage Garden. Get out, really? Yeah, before they were big. Uh Uh-huh, okay. With Darren Hayes in the car, I think on the way to his first gig somewhere, and I Want You had just dropped as a single and literally nobody besides the community stations were playing it at that stage. Oh, get out, really? Yeah. I still have it on tape somewhere. Maybe one day we'll get ourselves a um, a cassette player. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure I've got one floating around here somewhere. (laughs) But my point is, I always wanted to be a radio announcer, and I worked my ass off to work my way up in commercial radio to broadcast from my home city of Brisbane and, you know, achieved a lot of accolades like Best Newcomer in the Country at the Commercial Radio Awards, numerous number one rating surveys in Australia's third largest market, Brisbane. You've got your own string of angsties by the sound of it. (laughs) (laughs) I've won many angsties over my time. (laughs) Well, me, I've had an eclectic career, part of which was in radio, but you know that. I know. That was exciting, but mostly falling into leadership positions in like a range of industries. So on a personal side, I never Um, married. Okay. I never had children. Mm. Although the connection to my family, I'd consider it has always been quite close. So when both of my brother's kids were young, I felt like an integral part of the family. Things were fairly cohesive and, you know, there was a place for me within that. Um, you're missing a major part of this story, though, I think, Andy. Yeah, I think I forgot to mention that I'm gay. <sighs> Don't tell anybody. Shh. Shh, big secret. Big secret. Um, I should probably get that out of the way up front, though, because it's a fact that usually requires some explaining at some point in the conversation um, where people will ask if I've got kids or if I've got a wife. <laughs> Um, (laughs) We've had a business consultant that's been helping us that many times has asked me how Andy's wife is. She even married us on a couple of occasions herself, (laughs) I think. (laughs) She thought that the partner in business partner meant ooh la la. Well, I mean, you can imagine how that worked out for me as well when I worked in aged care because, you know, in some scenarios I would need throughout life to hop straight back into the closet. Mm. And there was another job I can remember I had where I went in on the first day and the team leader getting to know me said, oh, you know, if you're kids, and I said, no. Nah. And she looked a bit shocked and she said, why not? And I said, of oh, course, none of my boyfriends ever had a uterus. <laughs> That's a very nice way of saying it, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's just a bit of a comedic way to wake people up without kind of hitting them over the head with their own assumptions. So, you know, I think along the way we just kind of realised that people are different and they don't always fit neatly into our own model of the world. So, you know, I never really felt that I'd had a work identity as such like you Mm. have with radio because even though I've always wanted to work in a creative type role, I've always learned to take on other people's concerns like 
how are you going to pay the mortgage? Mm. Or, you know, statements like you really should have something to fall back on. You know, I've worked my whole career at making the best fallback option I could and I kind of feel like I've denied myself the chance to develop into the creative type of work that I always wanted to do. Well, I haven't had kids. I'm 40 now and I put all my effort into my career. Which, from an outsider's point of view, was going amazingly well. Right? Mm. Um, There I was, topping the Brisbane radio ratings and COVID hit. Uh, Which, you know, (laughs) changed a lot for a lot of people. (laughs) Well, have you got a couple of hours? (laughs) (laughs) Have you got 18 plus months? Yeah. But COVID made me reevaluate what was actually important because I saw a lot Mm. of change happening within the world and things weren't changing for me and I felt like I needed change too. I don't know how much of it actually ties to COVID, but it certainly was a catalyst and it did cause a chain reaction of events that showed me that I wasn't valued for my creativity. And I felt like I wasn't valuable. And that's something that pushed me to stand up for what I perceived my value to be. Yeah, which isn't easy to do because once you've been working in something for so long, sometimes you need that value to come from other places and sometimes that place is from yourself. Well, I already knew I wasn't living authentically for a long time. And I think I I reached that breaking point where I just couldn't do it anymore. Everything else in the world was changing and things just looked like they were going to get worse for me if I stayed the same. So long story short, how I got (laughs) here... When my contract renewal came up last time, my previous employer and I did not agree on my value and the job ended along with a link to an identity I'd held for eight plus years and an industry that I'd been involved in since I was 14 years old. Mm. That was a job that I once described as my dream and that industry was something that I took on accidentally, I suppose, as my identity. For a whole 26 years of your life. (laughs) It's a long time. (laughs) It is a long time. And, you know, I think 2020 had obviously incredible impact in a lot of ways to a lot Mm. of people. But I guess if I skip back to 2020 myself, I had just taken on a leadership role within a bank. And if you think about what I was saying a bit earlier about Mm. wanting the creative roles, it's probably the most diametrically opposite type of role that you could have to the stuff that I actually (laughs) wanted to do. So... COVID hit and all of that aside, you know, the biggest thing that happened for me in 2020 amongst all of that was my dad passed away. Yeah. Which was clearly, you know, for me, because I was close to my dad. I love my dad, as a lot of people do. And it was just one of the extra things in 2020 that really helped to, I guess, hammer a rusty nail into what was flapping about in my mental health at the time. Yeah. Wouldn't have helped as well that you were stuck behind a border, um, because your dad was in New South Wales and well, you're in dad South was Australia. In, yeah, that's right. So dad was in New South Wales. I was here in, in Adelaide and I got news that he was uh, sick and not likely to last long. So I travelled across to Sydney. I was fortunate enough to be there to see him before he went. But amongst all the pandemic, my partner couldn't come with me for support because we didn't know at the time how long dad was going to last. And then he you know, ended up going quite quickly. And then um, the funeral arrangements happened. It's all a blur. Like when that Mm. sort of thing happens, you're in shock. You're starting to grieve. All of these chemical processes are happening within your brain to protect you. But there's nothing that replaces the support of your partner Mm. when you're in that kind of situation. And COVID meant that he couldn't be there for me because we were interstate. There were restrictions. There were things that needed to be done when we were returning, Uh, all sorts of stuff. So there came a point within all of that, all of that mess, all of that horrible, horrible feeling stuff that I had to do something which was really difficult and say to my family, look, I need to go back to Adelaide because I have to pay the mortgage. I have to work. Um, That was a big part of it. And of course, you know, I have to admit my mental health was was terrible at the time as well. Mm. And what would a podcast about helping fix our mental health be without us deep diving into some of our mental health issues, Andy? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Too right. Too right. <laughs> um, so I suppose where we both sit in 2020 with mental health, if I rewind um, to a little bit before the leaving of that job for me, those mm. previous years I'd been suffering clinical depression and anxiety um, that I've come to realise now that I've lived with my whole life undiagnosed. And mm. I finally got diagnosed just before I left, um, in the probably six months before, started a medication. So how would that manifest for you? What sort of things were going on that were undiagnosed? Uh, Well, I was having frequent anxiety attacks. So Uh I did used to be a music director as well as a radio announcer. So I used to go to a lot of concerts. I love going to concerts. Live music Mm. is just 
um, chef's kiss, beautiful. But sometimes I'd have an anxiety attack at a concert if mm. things were too loud, if it was too hot, if it was too crowded. I'd have a lot of anxiety attacks on the way to work. We used to not have an elevator at a one before we moved addresses and I'd walk up the stairs to go to the studio and have an anxiety attack by the time I got up there. Wow. The thing is I recognise now from my now that we're recording this is our first episode but it's at the end journey that I've yeah. had a lot of um, depressive periods in my life that go back to when I was really young. And when I say depressive, I mean with suicidal ideation. Mm. So somehow I was able to pick myself up and push through them. But honestly, I think that anxiety and that need to prove my worthiness, as my psychologist would say, possibly to my dead father, has been something that's driven me a lot. So does it feel like that there were just triggers that were causing this to happen or were things happening around you to trigger things from what turns out to be earlier in life? A bit of both, I think. Mm. I mean, here I am, a successful number one morning announcer in Brisbane. My mm. listen to my voice, listen to my voice, Andy. Listen, um, chef's kiss, Louise. I've got a chef's kiss. Vo- I've got a beautiful Mwah. voice. I once had yeah. someone tell me never to swear with this voice because it doesn't sound right, and I say fuck them. But <laughs> I, I've got this beautiful rosy voice. I'm entertaining people. I'm trying to make them feel joyful and uplifted. But I was wearing a mask, not a COVID mask, a, <laughs> a, 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 a spiritual, metaphysical, um, metaphoric mask. Not like the mask singer. No, I wasn't wearing one of those masks either. <laughs> I was coming home and locking myself in my house. I was arguing with my partner. I was spending the whole weekend crying on the couch or just lying down, half dissociating. I'd even prepare deflection anecdotes for Monday morning. So when people asked me how my weekend was, I'd I'd have something ready because I was a skilled interviewer. So go on, ask me how my weekend is. Yeah. Hey, Lou, happy Monday. How's your weekend? Yeah, really good. Did you see that new series, The Witcher? Oh, my God, yeah, it's so good. We yeah. actually binged the whole lot, and I think um, I think I need a bit of sleep after all that. Uh, anyway, uh, look, do you want a coffee? I'm just about to hit down the cafe. Yeah, yeah. Like, like that. Like, have a line ready. This is uh-huh. how an interviewer does it if you want to deflect anybody. Not that I'm suggesting this because this is exactly what we're trying to unconstruct um, in this. But This is what we want to unlearn. <laughs> unlearn this um but if you have something ready you can people love to talk about themselves andy don't i know it Mm. because i think in some ways i've probably used some of those same techniques myself (laughs) at parties where people will start a conversation and then i say so what do you do and then hand the mic over for the next half an hour Mm. it's great Um, it's great it takes the pressure off you can hide you can. You can hide. And you can make people And people feel think you're such a good listener. They do. And they th- they, they think that you, um, you're really great at conversation, but they've generated mm. it all on their own. Yeah, I can relate to how you feel. Many years ago now, and it's actually been said to me since, a former partner of mine once said to me, why are you such a different person when you're with your family? Mm. You're a completely different person when you're around them compared to when you were around me or with our friends. And at the time, I just thought he'd just been crazy. Like, I didn't... <laughs> I thought, no, I'm not. I'm just me. But the more time wore on and the more I started to really observe myself, I'd realised I was wearing masks. I was actually being a different person in different places with different people. It's hard not to wear those masks, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Especially around people that you you love so much and also, number one, don't want to upset, but Mm. also, number two, that you really want the respect of. At this time when you're in Sydney and your dad's just Mm. passed away and you feel Mm. like you're wearing a mask around your family, was there anybody that you had around you where you didn't have to wear a mask? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My sister's from other misters. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got three really close girlfriends. You know, not girlfriends. 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 Yeah. Um, and Betty might they... have been right. Three girlfriends. <laughs> I know. I'm a player. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't tell anybody that Betty was our business, <laughs> business consultant. <laughs> Our best friend, Betty. Hi, Betty. Hi, Betty. (laughs) Um, But my three really, really treasured sisters, I call them, because they are that to me. I've known one of them since she was born, and that was when I was three months old, you know. So we've had a good history together and know each other really well. They they were there for me, and 
you know, they were there in ways that sometimes my own family couldn't be. And again, you know, as I said, they were going through grief as well. So we shouldn't have to feel like that we can be everything to everybody. Mm. So, you know, it was really wonderful to have the support of those three women there with me while I was there. And they were looking out for me. They were they were making sure it was okay. Really strikes me something you said before um, about having to return to work to pay the mortgage. Mm. Like, <laughs> mm, I know. And the yeah. decisions that we make that are you know, money motivated because we have no choice but to make the money to survive. Well, also, you know, in Australia, and I know that in this isn't just particular to Australia, but when somebody passes away, you get bereavement leave. But that bereavement leave is the equivalent of about two days. Yeah. I think so... I got. I think I got two days off when my dad died, and the rest I took as um, personal leaves. It came out of my sick mm. leave days. Mm. Yeah, and I've always thought that that was really harsh because nobody, a lot of people don't even enter the initial stages of grief, no. get out of shock in the first two days. That's just the organising. That's, that's just, just the organising. That's just that's, finding finding things to put in the coffin to weigh that's it down. Chatting to the undertaker, that's <laughs> making all the arrangements, is doing all of those things that you have to do. Because when we die, we become a bunch of admin tasks. That's going to be the quote of the episode, Andy. There when we go. die, we become a bunch of admin tasks. Yeah, we do. And it's really sad. It is and really sad. Amongst all of those admin tasks, you've got people who have lost someone who's really important to them. The thing about grief, um, I think grief is grief, whether we're talking about people who are deceased or losing jobs. And I know some people might think that sounds flippant, but grief is grief. Whatever Absolutely. affects you, affects you. Absolutely. I know at the end of my story, with the end of um, my journey in the tribe of media, COVID had caused all these things where the industry was cutting jobs, cutting costs. Everyone mm -hmm. was starting to take on more work for literally less money. Pay cuts happening due to the uncertain new landscape. While people like me were taking voluntary pay cuts, like we saw the harsh alternative around us as well as other content creators in the industry were being made redundant due to the impact of the pandemic. I saw so many friends lose jobs. Yeah, um, it, and how it they felt so many about industries. That. Yeah. yeah, across all industries and all all walks of life, suddenly what people thought was quite secure suddenly became up for grabs. And going through the grief of losing that part of who they were as well. Well, when you think about it, you know, it, it's not flippant to consider that you had spent 26 years of your life with this partner. Yeah. You'd spent 26 <laughs> years you of your life. If you think about it like a relationship. Giving all of yourself to this entity in this case, a career that suddenly wasn't there anymore. Of course, you're going to grieve over that. Yeah, and and this period of time before I left there, you know, I I saw colleagues being made redundant. Um, mm. I watched concessions being made for others to work from home for safety at reduced hours because of the pay cut. But I was still required to work from a studio in the city and put in a day of annual leave once a fortnight that I still had to come in on and work on mm. if I wanted to be paid my pre-COVID amount of money. Um, yeah. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel valued, Andy. Well, you wouldn't. <laughs> I dare say if you're kind of <laughs> saying, here's a day's annual leave I'm claiming and I'll see you Friday anyway because I need to be paid. That probably doesn't feel too good, you know? Like, I know that everybody's making concessions as a result of, of this pandemic and, you know, and people will say in toxic positivity's ways that, you know, oh, well, some people have got it worse off, you got a job mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. But um, there were also some, some pretty awful things happening out there with people and, and to people because of the pandemic as well. And yeah. you can't overlook that. We're looking at, at each of our stories here. There's definitely a theme of grief there. I mean, that's why when we first started talking about this project, you, you know, we were talking about doing a podcast about grief because we both had experienced loss at that mm. point in time. Also, you had not too far in the distant past lost your own father. Yeah, that was, um, I think, about three years ago or so. And I, I do think that's a different story than your loss because mm. um, as the series is going to show, we weren't always close and there's a lot of other stuff in there with that um, that you felt differently about your dad than I felt about mine. Um, but you're right, grief manifests in all sorts of ways. Yeah, I mean, to this day, there are still people within my family that I don't talk to, mm. which I find quite sad but also you know in some ways sometimes we need space to figure out who we are and and what that relationship means as well so i think now we've brought everybody down on a series where we told them that we were going to lift them up <laughs> <laughs> uh, how about a turning point why why did we decide to do this 
Well, why did you want to take on this change? Because this series isn't just about making a series. It's about changing all these preconceived notions of ourselves. I remember when when we first started talking about this, I was I was working at the bank still. I kind of had a, a sneaking suspicion that things weren't going to kind of pan out the way I initially thought nine months earlier. And I thought, you know, I, I actually really want to be at a place in my life where I want to be in charge. I want to actually not be at somebody else's effect, mm. if that makes sense. So if you can... Okay, so this is this is quite a bold thing that I decided to do to prove the point to myself. Mm-hmm. But I was on a month-by-month extension of the contract and I thought, well, you know what? I would much rather say, thanks for the time. The job's been great. Really enjoyed working with you. But let's call the end of this month, the end of this month, and then come and start a business with you knowing all of the uncertainties that come with that but to me those uncertainties are mine to control whereas the uncertainty i had with well we're gonna have a job next month was really not up to me and you know what i think that's pretty close to how i felt because when that contract renewal came up and i didn't feel valued I, you know, stated the value I thought that I was worth. They didn't agree and I wouldn't compromise. And Mm. so ended my radio career. Poof. (laughs) Gone. We can't say that anymore, Andy. Of course we can. I can. (laughs) You can. (laughs) (laughs) That was the end. I mean, it's kind of an act of self-empowerment because it's like, no, I'm worth more than this, but then what? It was both the right thing to do and pretty, pretty terrifying. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do next. I had nothing lined up. Those six months between when I left that job and we started this business while you were still at the bank, you Mm -hmm. know, my depression and anxiety got worse, not better. Mm. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) Two of my cats died. That was was sad. I talk about dead things in this episode. I grieve more for my dead cats than my dead father, that's for sure. But my goodness, I would never wish a dead pet on anybody, let alone two within the space of a month. (laughs) But at that time... I couldn't leave my yard. Um, The anxiety attacks were pretty bad. Uh, I couldn't go to places in Brisbane that I associated with my old workplace or my old routines. I remember conversations we were having and you had difficulty thinking about going past that front gate (laughs) without Uh, a word of a lie or a joke. I know. It sounds like we're making it up, but I have a a gate at the front of the house, like across the front, um, and it's, you know, got a lock on it and I couldn't leave yard past the gate i would give you little activities and challenges and i just get uber eats and you and they pass it over the gate (laughs) 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 um but sometimes i would get past the gate um and i'd start to drive a way that i used to go to go to work and that knot of anxiety would just start rising in my chest and constricting and um (laughs) even I would just start to have that feeling that that anxiety attack was going to happen just driving those paths. I didn't know who I was anymore without that identity of a career, even though I was hiding behind it. I think also from my perspective as well, when you talk about identity, I I kind of, I'm an observer and I'm a, I'm a deep thinker and mm. I started to see myself behaving in ways that I didn't like. I actually started to see patterns of that type of behavior across different areas within the relationships I have. So for me, it was wanting to actually pull back and, you know, somebody suggested to me, have a bloody good look at myself because... (laughs) Take a good look at yourself. Yeah, exactly. Because I've always kind of felt that I do that anyway. And I think that I've actually been on a pretty good growth path, you know, if I do so say myself for the past (laughs) 20 odd years. But there is always room for improvement. And there's always something else that inevitably pops up that you think, ah, didn't catch that. You know, around the time of dad's passing, I caught it. Yeah. And I didn't like it. So I decided that I couldn't be a part of that anymore. And if that meant not being able to have some people in my life for however long, then I had to do that for myself because I didn't want to hurt them. I didn't want to go on hurting them with any of those behaviours myself. And I was damned if I was going to let them hurt me in the same way. You and I first worked together in Darwin Mm. uh, about 12, 13, how long ago? 14 years ago? It was from January 2009 until, (laughs) (laughs) until July 2010. 
I was uh, content director of uh, the commercial stations in Darwin and um, Andy was my assistant content director. I was and I called myself Mimi because I set up my desk because uh, Ms Poole often had unwelcome visitors and I had to be her um, gatekeeper. <laughs> So, and just I like the Drew Carey show. I, I appreciate everybody that you gatekeeped out of my office. <laughs> Even with the fake call app. After I left that last job and I was wondering what I should do in between my moments of uh, depression and anxiety, I guess I had a good moment when I called Andy and said, what you doing? Want to make a podcast? And I went, oh, yeah, that sounds fun. <laughs> Even though he, he's been working <laughs> at the bank for years. And well, I've been working at the bank. I've been looking bank. at aged care, call centre here and there. I was, I was tech support for an internet company for a while. <laughs> I mean, when I say I've had an eclectic career, I'm not lying. Mm. I've, I've, I've been places. I've seen some things. So the very first incarnation of this series, which we were discussing long before you left the bank and long before we decided to form Welcome Change Media, which is our business, mm. It was a 10-episode series and the topics were things like, what if no one wants to hear what I've made? And why do I crave change? And why do I matter? And that's because they were things we were feeling at the time. Yeah. I was looking at that recently myself, that list, and I thought it was curious how we, the episode we named as Reframe Your Mind was episode number seven out of 10. So Mm -hmm. to actually get an entire 42 part series out of that concept alone, I think is um, kind of indicative of the journey that we've been on. Yeah, because the idea just kept getting bigger and bigger. (laughs) It became a business idea. (laughs) Almost like shiny object syndrome. (laughs) After I was already six months without a job and uh, (laughs) six months at home, afraid to go beyond my game. Yeah. Andy joined my madness and said, oh, let's do this business full time. So the new incarnation of Reframe of Mind is that story along the way from the moment that we start the business to now, the first episode that we've recorded last. When we actually started out, we actually made a pact. Mm. Go all in. Absolutely. Prepared to share our own vulnerabilities along the way, just as others were prepared to share theirs with us. And we did hear some really great stories along the way. Mm. And I think they really did inspire us to think, okay, well, if they're brave enough to share their stories with us, then it's only fair that we share our story with you. And it's not a salacious hatchet job on anyone related to our journeys. If you're after gossip, you're in the wrong place because... (laughs) Um, I suppose in the true self-indulgent sense of the word, it's all about us, you know. This is This is our perspective on our experience through these things that were happening around us. You know, we said earlier that sometimes it feels like life's on autopilot. Well, guess what? This is a snapshot of us in autopilot going, Oh my god, oh my god, what are we gonna do now? And it's it's basically an honest account of our emotional responses. Um, of our learning and growth along the way. And it's not always a comfortable journey either, but this Mm. is authentic. And we hope you get something out of it too. It was never our intention actually to put our story into this series, but because of the conversations and the growth and the work that we've put in, well, we're standing in a place where sharing our vulnerability is powerful. It doesn't just happen. It took us a lot of work to get to this point. Yeah, sometimes this sort of thing can turn into trauma porn. You know, mm. and that's not something that we ever wanted to create, and we never ever wanted to give the impression that there's a quick fix to everything either, because it just wouldn't do justice to the people that we've spoken to, or the work they've put in, and the long, difficult conversations we've both had to get to where we are today, where we actually feel comfortable sharing our darkest moments, knowing that you still might not like it or even care. We haven't come into this as a narcissistic feature or to say, this trauma is the best thing that's happened to me because (laughs) it would be far better if these things hadn't happened to us and didn't happen to anybody else. Mm, But they did and they do. Mm. And we're happy to share that arc of our journey with you. Not as we originally intended to, but because there came a point in writing this series where it wouldn't have felt right to do it any other way. That brings us to the end of our first episode of Reframe of Mind, which is more like a prologue, actually, than an episode, right, Andy? Yeah, we've been talking about how the series morphed over time. It's quite different to how we initially intended. And we joke about it all being about us, but it's not, really. It's a lot of stories from a lot of great people. And next time, you'll get to meet one of those great people with their story. The 2021 Queensland Australian of the Year, Dinesh Palapana, shares his story about becoming Queensland's first quadriplegic medical graduate. In our lives, we have so many people having an opinion about what we should do. But at the end of the day, when you look back at life, there's only one person who 
you can hold to account, and that's you. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional advice and support. You can contact Beyond Blue on 1300 224 636 or at beyondblue.org.au. Or you can contact Lifeline on 131114 or at lifeline.org.au. We'd like to thank today's guests for sharing their personal stories and insights. And for more information on any of the subjects, guests or references used in this episode, please see our show notes or reframeofmind.com.au. Reframe of Mind is a Welcome Change Media production.